the castle. And his French teacher was Aldous Huxley, a member of the Fabian Society. And he introduced Orwell to the Fabian Society. And that's where they got their information from. That's why, from the point of view of 2010, we look at those two novels. Huxley's was published in 1932. Uh, Orwell's was published in 1948. And we say, it's just amazing. It's happened, just like they said. But they were only novels. No, they weren't. They knew what was coming because they had access to the projected future, the projected agenda, through the Fabian society. Anyway, this is, says the takeover is almost complete, stupid humans and all that stuff. And that's what they think is happening. The game is over. No, it's bloody not. And after we've had a decent break this time of 45 minutes, I'll go into how this relates to our daily lives and the society we live in today. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to bring it down uh, into this reality, the one that we experience in our everyday lives, and, and how what we talked about so far affects life here. This section is about manipulation of what I call five sense reality, manipulation of our daily lives. And <clears throat> there are certain coordinates which, uh, if we have them, we can read the world with much greater clarity than if we don't have them. And one of the uh, coordinates is how do they do it? How do a few people, in full knowledge a few people, control the lives or direct and influence the lives of billions? Um, just to quick, quickly recap, the idea is to hold us in this frequency range of perception in a very low level of awareness and we identify who we are with the physical body to use these hybrid bloodlines to manipulate human society by controlling the banking system and the political system and all the rest of it. And through this structure, coming down into the, the movie, as I call it, what we see on the television news as what we call news and current affairs. And the idea is to structure society as a pyramid where the few at the top of the pyramid have the greater knowledge of reality and, and all that we talked about today uh, passed on to them at the highest level of this secret society network and the people are kept in ignorance of that knowledge. That is absolutely fundamental to the few controlling the many um, and to keep the people in ignorance, to pull that knowledge out of circulation and to try to stop it coming into human society. The positions of power, uh, which we think are there, like presidents, prime ministers, heads of the World Bank, NATO, are actually here, if, if even that. These people are put into power, apparent power, to administer into human society decisions made by this group of interbreeding families, which are answerable to the control network and run the control network. And <clears throat> the world is basically structured as pyramids within pyramids, like Russian dolls, one doll inside a bigger doll inside a bigger doll. And so if you look at the various aspects of, 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 of the world, you have a banking pyramid. Um, an individual bank is a pyramid, but then that goes into a greater pyramid called the global banking system. And at the top of that are these families manipulating the banking system. The transnational corporations are pyramids um, in themselves but they go into the network of uh, transnational corporations and at the top of that pyramid the same people that control the banks control the transnational corporations. It's the same with the military, it's the same with politics, I'll come to that in a second, it's the same with the media, religion, intelligence agencies, the pharmaceutical cartel, uh, organized crime and the, uh, the uh, hard illegal drug market globally, it's all controlled by these families ultimately through this pyramid within pyramid system. And uh, this is uh, 
Neil Haig's symbolism of it. You've got the reptilian uh, other dimensional control behind it, but it comes down through the various levels. And you're not very far down here before you're meeting the levels that don't know what happens here. It's very tightly knit, and it has to be, because the, if, if too many people find out about this, then the system's in trouble. And this is where um, humans are in the general society, in the box, and these are the administrators and dark suits, and that's the control system at the top. And we're all holding it together. When we decide not to, it's over for the control system. You can also, like I've said, symbolize it as the spider's web, the Rothschilds and the uh, right close to the spider controlling the secret societies, the European Union, the, the media and, and all the rest of it. And through that, you can manipulate global society through apparently unconnected countries, people, organizations. And it's this network that spews out the world leaders. Not every single one, but vast numbers of them. Some of them, the few, are people who know what they represent. The vast majority are just put in there because they want power or, or they, they, uh, they have ambition and all the rest of it. They want political power and all the rest of it. And certain people with certain mentalities are put in there at a certain time when that mentality is what they, the control system wants. Good example, perfect example. It is absolutely no coincidence that in 1979 in Britain, Margaret Thatcher came to power as the first woman Prime Minister of Britain, and her natural economic instincts became known as Thatcherism. It was privatizing state assets and all the rest of it. One year later, in 1980, on the other side of the Atlantic, a man came to power called Ronald Reagan, theoretically to power, because the vice president was the real power, George Bush, Father George Bush. And, and, and what happened in that period in America? We had an economic ethos called Reaganomics that was a mirror of Thatcherism in Britain, and it transformed the economies, uh, not just of those two nations, but, the, but it was in many ways the world. Um, and the number of people who are doing it in full knowledge of what they represent is tiny compared with those that are just put in there to do a job and then out you go. So we've got this structure I mentioned earlier with the, con the, the reptilian control system outside of this reality coming down through these various um, bloodline hybrids to control uh, human society. And if you bring it down to the country level, and this will be virtually everywhere you'll find this, this is the American example, You've got uh, a president who's a Republican and then a president who is a Democrat. Now, it's well documented that the Bush administration was controlled by a group of people who became known as the neocons or neoconservatives. And they were um, aspects or assets of the control system. Then in comes a Democrat and he's controlled, Obama, by a group of people that I have called the Democons, another group of assets of the control system. So the people think that the president has changed, that the party in power has changed, but actually that remains in control. And you find that almost everywhere, because if you're going to stop people rebelling, by letting them know they're in a tyranny and a dictatorship, you've got to hide the fact as best you can that it's a dictatorship and give them the, the idea that they're making uh, decisions on their lives. So when during the Bush administration I was hearing, George Bush, big brother, he wasn't even little sister. <laughs> Couldn't tie his shoelaces on a bad day. And then we're hearing big brother Obama, he's just another puppet of the control system and when they're finished with him off he goes. And um, this uh, symbolizes it perfectly. Off comes the mask of Bush, on goes the mask of Obama, but the face behind it remains the same. This is going on all over the world all the time. Different uh, name, same control system. And this is what I call the movie. This is what we see on the television news and in the newspapers. This movie going on 
And then behind it, there is the same force that are manipulating both sides. And if you manipulate both sides and control both sides, you can therefore know the outcome of something before the sequence even starts. The cards moved around the table, not by accident, by cold calculated design. And it's being done by people with a genetic uh, inability to empathize with the consequences for others of their actions. And this is why I say to people, if you judge what these people would do by what you would do, then you're never going to understand what's going on in the world. You would not pepper bomb Baghdad. You would not orchestrate 3,000 dead people on 9-11. But they would. They don't see, they don't decode reality the way most of the population does. And to hide this from the people, there's all these diversions and detours and, and ways of getting us to look that way so we don't see what's going on over there. The control system demands, survives through the creation of puppet people. People who don't think, who, who, who just go through uh, life like automatons and think that what they're told on the TV news or by politicians is in any way, anywhere close to what's actually going on. And it's putting humans in this uh, collective um, closed circuit that allows the control system to exist and prosper. Now there's a simple equation. When, when you are the few, and my goodness, these people are the few, and you want to control the many, one thing you have to do, and that is centralized decision making, centralized power. The more diversity you have in decision making, the more it's devolved in, in, away from the center, the less control you have over those decisions. You know, if you, um, what used to happen years ago when I was a kid, there used to be acts on the stage, you see them on the television sometimes, where, where they, would, they would keep plates spinning on sticks all over the stage, loads of them, and they keep running around and wicking the stick and it would spin. But eventually, if you have too many plates and too many sticks, it's just crashing plates everywhere. Ideally, what you want is one big plate and one big stick, because you can do that forever. And that's what they want with centralization of power. The structure they're looking for, we're moving towards it so fast, is a world government that would dictate to every country. Uh, it would have um, in its, in its uh, structure a world central bank that would dictate to all uh, finance, all global finance. In the end, it wants a global currency which wouldn't be money in your hand. It would purely be one single electronic currency for which there are fundamental implications for freedom because if you go into a store now and you hand over electronic money, a credit card, and the computer says, sorry, it won't accept your card, at least you can still pay cash. When there's no cash in circulation and it's going out of circulation at a phenomenal speed, then when that computer says no to your card or your microchip, as it's designed to be eventually, then you have no other means of purchase and the computer is deciding your life. And um, they also want a world army. This is what is happening with NATO and the European army. They're planning all this. It's, it's taking uh, the military out of uh, sovereign states and creating um, supernatural uh, national um, armies because they're moving um, towards this uh, world army. And a journalist said to me once, what would be the use of a world army? There'd be no one to fight. And I said, you're a journalist, aren't you? Um, of course, it's, it's to impose upon the people and any countries or communities that don't want to accept the will of the world government to impose that will through uh, force with the world army. Uh, they want microchipped people with children microchipped at birth as a matter of course. And I'll, I'll come to that as we go along. Under that structure, they want the European Union, that's well advanced, an American Union, Stepping stone to that is the North American Union, Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Uh, they want a Pacific Union, that's uh, Australia and the, and the Far East, and they want an African Union, which have already got, of course, the African Union. And uh, the European Union came out of the European Economic Community. The American Union is designed to come out of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Again, free trade. 
uh, good for jobs and they don't tell you it's leading to political union. The Pacific Union is designed to come out of APEC and another uh, economic grouping in that area and the African Union is already there. And under that would come nation states and regions and in terms of Europe they want to break nation states up into regions. So nation states would end and that's to de-unify in a unified response to this edifice of power. So, coordinate two, methods of manipulation. Well, there's two that if we understand them, we start reading the world in a very different way. The first one I've been calling for years, problem, reaction, solution. This is devastating. Devastating in its effectiveness and it's used upon us all the time. You want to change society or the world in a way that you know that if you announced openly, this is what I want to do, you would have a big anti-opposition reaction to it. So you don't announce it openly. At stage one, you create a problem. Uh, it could be a war, it could be a terrorist attack, which you've manipulated. It could be a, a, a crash, uh, an economic crash, whatever. Whatever is necessary, for you to then get a reaction from the public of fear and outrage or whatever and, and do something, do something, what are they going to do? And then those who've covertly created the problem, got the public reaction, do something, then openly offer the solutions to the problems they have created, which are changes in legislation and society that um, further advance the centralization of power and the police state. It comes from... Uh, a motto uh, for the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, which says, Ordo ab chao, order out of chaos. Create the chaos, get the reaction, offer the order out of the chaos, the new order, which is the new structure that you want. There is no better example of problem, reaction, solution than 9-11. You create the problem where you have these attacks in America, you from almost minutes after they happen start feeding into the mainstream media that Osama bin Laden orchestrated it from some cave in Afghanistan. He must have had a mobile phone or something. And, and then as a result of the horror of 9-11 and the reaction from the public, the public mind is then open for you to offer the solution. And the solutions uh, as a result of 9-11 have transformed this world with more and more control, surveillance, um, under the name of anti-terrorism legislation, etc. And uh, it has um, been the major change, major thing that's driven this from the start. Uh, which has led to the invasion of Afghanistan, B by implication, the invasion of Iraq, stopping terrorism and all that stuff, and all from a terrorist event in which the terrorists had dark suits and lived in America and other places. This is um, Sabignu Brzezinski. He was President Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, and he is one of the major mentors and advisors to uh, Barack Obama. He's been bringing Obama through since at least the 1980s. And this is what he wrote in 1997. Uh, what was it? Three years before, four years before 9-11. Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may uh, find it some uh, more difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues except in the circumstance of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. And in other writings, which I've documented in my books, um, these, uh, this neocon group behind the Bush administration produced a document in September 2000 saying that America needed a new Pearl Harbor to justify the agenda of country acquisition and other things that this, this neocon wanted. One year later, after that document was published, they had their new Pearl Harbor 9-11, and they knew it was coming. So this says, jet fuel, that's a good one. The story of 9-11 is a joke. 
It's an insult to the intelligence, to anyone who has done a modicum of research. It just so happens that they were the only two towers of their kind that have ever collapsed because of fire. These are similar towers around the world that burned for much longer and did not collapse. Only two towers ever have. And it's kind of interesting, I saw this the other day, this is a small nuclear explosion and it turns things to dust and, and reacts in that way. That reminds me of something. The idea that those buildings fell because they hit by planes is ridiculous. I mean, we, we now have pilots against 9-11, talking about the ludicrous part of the story about the planes. We have engineers against 9-11, talking about the ludicrous story of the buildings collapsing. This says, smells like bullshit, which is basically what the 9-11 story is. Total rubbish. And what happens is that you, you have the problem, in this case the attacks of 9-11, and then that version of them is passed to the public by a mainstream media that just accepts the official version as true and repeats it. Journalists, mainstream journalists, are just repeaters, 90% of them. And because they don't investigate if the official story stands up to scrutiny, they just pass it on unquestioned to the public and turn the mainstream media not into a situation of journalism, but a situation of propaganda for the government version of events. And so when through this system you control people like uh, the terrorist groups which you've set up, like the Mujahideen in um, Afghanistan, which was a 100% American creation, you control the agencies that, that do these false flag events, you control the media that then report them, uh, and you then use um, your agencies in government to impose legislation taking away freedoms as a result of these events that you yourself have created. Problem, reaction, solution. And then you frighten them to death. Oh, severe warning. Is it, is it orange or is it red? Ah. And they don't find Osama bin Laden because if they did, the truth would be out. He died in 2002, it seems, of, a ki of kidney trouble. But they still produce these videos, and if, you, if people understand how uh, sophisticated it is now, when you, make, you can make videos, you can make people say uh, things, and you can make them say them in their own voice, uh, uh, language, and uh, uh, the tone, and everything. The technology is there to completely uh, make these fraudulent videos that uh, you can see them in Hollywood movies where they get cats speaking and, and you think, crikey, it looks like the cat's speaking. That's what they can do. This is the story of 9-11 coming from Adolf Hitler when he proposed the creation of the Gestapo in Nazi Germany. He said, an evil exists that threatens every man, woman and child of this great nation. We must take steps to ensure our domestic security and protect our homeland. Let's Let's create the Gestapo. And exactly the same principles have been used in the world since 9-11. The Second World War, like the first, was a global problem reaction solution. These bloodlines controlled Soviet communism and the, the so-called capitalist countries of Britain, America, etc. They also controlled the Nazi party and helped to bring it to power. They then brought these into conflict in the Second World War. It was the second world conflict in a few decades, and at the end of it, people were physically, emotionally, and mentally exhausted. And when you um, study mind control projects, one of the things they do to the victims is before, as before they're putting in the mind manipulation, they get them mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausted. And so, the way to stop conflict, which this has created, is to create centralized um, institutions which this has created. Problem, reaction, solution. After the First World War, power in the world was in far fewer hands than it was before. After the Second World War, it was in even fewer. And so it's gone on since with all the global institutions. And then there's another version of this technique, which I call pro no problem, reaction, solution. No problem, reaction, solution weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. You don't need 
a real problem, often you need a public perception of one because that works just as well. So no problem reaction solution is uh, like global warming, a no problem reaction solution. And going along with that technique is another one that I call the totalitarian tiptoe. This works like this. You're at A and you know you're taking the world to Z. But if you go in too big a leap, the change is so great that people look up from the game show and the soccer match and they say, what's going on? So you go as far as you can, as quick as you can, but you're trying not to go so fast as to alert too many people to connect the dots and see where it's leading. Totalitarian tiptoe. And I have just described the European Union. They said um, that in this uh, poster, fascism, you really think it would this, be this obvious. Well, it is becoming that obvious in some countries in the world, but this totalitarian tiptoe means that they can get there by steps without alerting too many people until it's too late. That's the idea. Like I say, the European Union is the totalitarian tiptoe from start to finish. And um, let's have their own words. This is a letter written by Jean Monnet, the so-called founding father of the European Union and a Rothschild frontman, in a letter to a friend, 30th of April, 1952, the day after I was born, that long ago. And this is what he said in it. Europe's nations should be guided towards the super state without their people understanding what is happening. This can be accomplished by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, but will eventually and irreversibly lead to federation. That's what's been going on before our eyes all these years, and the Lisbon Treaty was one of the last steps to that irreversible federation. That's why they didn't have referendums on it all over Europe because they knew that uh, the people would turn it down. The European Union is the, you can call it communism or you can call it fascism. Certainly it fits the very symbol from which the word fascism comes, the fasci from the Roman Empire. This symbol of, of rods being tied together, individual, individuality tied together and ruled from the center. That's exactly what is happening in the European Union, but you can, you can uh, refer to it as communism. It's the same thing. And talking of communism, fascism took over part of Europe, communism took over part of Europe, the European Union is taking over the whole of bloody Europe, step by step. Look at it now. No other tyranny ever got that far in what we call modern times. And it's got there without a shot being fired. One of the things they had to do and I wrote about this at the time, to bring the, see, there was a period where it suited the control system to have the division between East and West, where you had the, the Cold War, it was called, because lots of things were possible in the Cold War, like enormous military spending that wouldn't have been possible unless people were felt in a threatened situation. But then there came the time when they went to the next stage, which is where they had to start encompassing the countries of the Soviet Union into both NATO, the World Army, and into the European Union. And there's no way they were going into NATO or the European Union while they were in the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. So they brought in a man called Mikhail Gorbachev, who was an asset of the Rockefeller family in America, to be the smiling face that led to this change. Now, I don't think there's many people who are living in the countries of the former Soviet Union or controlled by the former communist bloc who aren't happier not in it. But the question is, again, what we're seeing here is this. I talked earlier about when the colonial powers um, withdrew from the Americas, the, the, the British Empire withdrew and all the rest of it. They went from a dictatorship you could see, touch and taste and would therefore at some point rebel against into a dictatorship that 
appeared to be freedom because you have a vote every four or five years, but actually the same crowd were in, were in power. For instance, in South Africa during apartheid, South Africa was controlled by a Rothschild subordinate family called the Oppenheimers. Under black majority rule, in fact it's, it's not a democracy as South Africa, it's a one-party state called the ANC, but, but under a black majority rule, who controls South Africa? The Oppenheimer family does, a subordinate of the Rothschild family. But, but the difference is, people rebelled against apartheid, quite rightly, but they're not rebelling in anything like the same way, although I think there's going to be a lot of trouble in South Africa soon, uh, because, the, because they have a vote. This is what is now happening in, in, in the, the former countries of the Soviet bloc and Soviet-controlled Soviet countries. So to do that, they had to open up revolutions that appeared to be people's revolutions, but just changed from dictatorship you can see to a dictatorship you can't see, Eastern Bloc to European Union. And they, they, they called them names, so in, 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 the, in, in the Czech Republic, the Velvet Revolution. And then we had the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine, the Rose Revolution in Georgia. And if you notice, after the last election in Iran, they tried to have a green revolution, but it wouldn't stick and, and, and didn't work. And behind um, most of these revolutions, if not all of them, is this man, George Soros, who again is an asset of the House of Rothschild. He's a billionaire American who has a network of trusts that actually um, are fronts for orchestrating things like these uh, people's revolutions. And if you talk to journalists and stuff in places like Georgia, they will openly tell you this guy was behind the revolution in Georgia. And uh, Sarkis Bali, the man who was the symbol for the revolution in Georgia, ended up as president. And it's amazing how many of these revolutions, the, the people who kind of are there at the start, end up in power. And this guy is funding them, and he has a, a network of organizations that school people in the art of civil disobedience. And the idea is to stimulate uh, a kind of upset and, and, and a sense of grievance. And then, at a point where the authorities, like the army, could put an end to it at that early point, they don't. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, there's an overthrow. And people say, OK, it's, it's brilliant because it's now a free country. Now, it might be a nicer country to live in, but it ain't a free country because we're now changing from control of Europe by the Eastern Bloc and uh, the, the Nazis at one point into control by the European Union. I mean, this is where the European Union is now. All this here, and they're picking off other ones all the time. And people are thinking, because it's a free, uh, 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 oh, we can vote for European politicians. Oh, yes, and they, they have no say in European policy. So you have the Czech Republic, occupied by the Habsburg family, one of these hybrid bloodlines, big time. And then you have, occupied by the Nazis, occupied by the Soviet bloc, in effect, and now occupied by the European Union. The difference is, the country chose to be occupied by the European Union. And that's how it works. Giving people the idea that they're making free choices when they're making choices to um, sit in the prison that they can't see the bars. And again, this guy, I don't know what this man uh, is like, President Klaus, in his general politics and all the rest of it, but what he said about the European Union and had the guts to go there and tell them despite massive opposition, was absolutely right. He said, in effect, the European Union is just a new version of the Politburo uh, from the Soviet Union. And Soviet dissidents who have come to the West, who lived under the Politburo, have said exactly the same. It works exactly the same. And what the Lisbon Treaty has done, which of course he didn't want to sign, it's opened the floodgates for a bureaucratic tidal wave to engulf Europe Globalization is simply the agenda I've been talking about for 20 years unfolding before our eyes. 
Again, if you want to centralize power, if you want to control people and you're the few, you have to centralize power. And the other thing that happens is the more you centralize power, the more power that you then have at the center to centralize even quicker. So it gets faster and faster. Globalization, where people uh, you know, protest about globalization and the effect it has on people, not least in the developing world, that is simply a name for this global agenda of centralized dictatorship unfolding. Free trade. It's not free trade at all. It's freedom to exploit. It's freedom to bring down tariff barriers so you can make your products here for a few cents on the dollar um, with starvation wages, if that, and then you can ship them across to the rich world and, and charge high prices without being penalized by big tariffs when you cross a border. And they brought in this thing called the World Trade Organization, again, a Rothschild Rockefeller front, and it can now impose massive fines on any country that wants to protect its economy and its people from this merciless global system. And that's what it's there to do. The idea is to make every single area of the world dependent on other parts of the world outside of its control. And that means that anything that controls the system in its entirety is controlling every single country on the planet, therefore every person on the planet. Coordinate three, the cement. There are certain groups and networks which hold this global control system together. Uh, within the, the webs, there are certain groups that are very, very significant in holding the web together and enforcing the policy. One of these groups are secret societies. The Jesuits are massively involved, the Knights of Malta, the Freemasons, the Knights Templar, uh, Opus Dei, and many others. And again, it's like a pyramid within pyramids within pyramids. Um, these are, appear to be individual secret societies but at the highest level, they fuse into the same web, the same network. Again, they're masks on the same uh, face. And secret societies, what we call Satanism, the ritual sacrifice and, 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 and these blood drinking rituals, etc., and child abuse, which is shocking in the world. People have no idea how many children go missing in the world every year because, understandably, they relate the number to how many missing children stories they see in the newspapers and on the news. A few years ago, back in the 90s, I was trying to help someone who was having their children stolen by the state. And I rang the federal government in America and asked how many children go missing in America every year. They couldn't tell me. Tell me how many cars went missing, not children. They said, you don't have to ring every state. By the time I got to 10, with the question, how many children went missing in your state last year, I was in to hundreds of thousands. How many people know that? Then you talk to uh, people like Kreda Mutwa in South Africa, and he tells you all the black children go missing in South Africa. And there's a reason why these things are fundamentally connected. There literally are rings within rings, like the Olympic rings. They, not every member of a secret society is a Satanist. Not every Satanist is a member of a secret society. Not every member of a secret society is a pedophile. But not every Satanist is a pedophile. Not every pedophile is a Satanist. But at the core, at the center, at the control system level, these are fundamentally connected. What I've found as I've traveled around the world researching this for 20 years in 50 countries, well, 51 now, with the Czech Republic, um, is a blueprint. You know when people start talking to me now and they, they tell me what's happening in their country over various things, I know what's coming. Because I've heard it so many times before. It literally is a blueprint uh, for the, the way it works. And this is, the reason is, they've set up this control system like a hologram. So I said in the first section today, um, every part of a hologram is a smaller version of the whole. Not a section of the whole, a smaller version of the whole. So you have a global control system, 
And then this is the island I live on, on the south, off the south coast of the Isle of Wight. It's only 35 miles by 15, off the south coast of England, rather. And this island is controlled by the same blueprint that controls the planet. And every society, every city, every country I go into, I see the same thing. And the, like I say, three of the things that come up all the time whenever you research these people who are manipulating global events, you come into Satanism, you come into secret societies, and you come invariably into pedophilia, which is absolutely rife at the top end, or what we call the top end, of global society. Now, there was a, a film, the last film of an American director called Stanley Kubrick, was called Eyes Wide Shut. And what he depicted in that film was satanic rituals going on in the mansions of the American elite. He knew that because he was an insider. When he produced the film, it was the last film he ever produced, he showed it to the executives, I think it was uh, Warner Brothers, and a very, very short time later, Kubrick's dead. After his death, um, they took 15 to 20 minutes out of the film, which no one has ever seen. And there was enough in it, never mind what they took out, if you knew what you were looking for, that is. And what he was depicting was something that goes on as a matter of daily life in the upper, so-called upper cesspit levels of society. People have uh, learned a lot in recent years about Bohemian Grove in California, where the elite of America, the bankers and the politicians and all these people, the media owners, they go to do rituals under this 40-foot stone owl at Bohemian Grove, um, about 75 miles north of San Francisco. We're talking the Bushes, we're talking Clinton, we're talking these major names, Kissinger, the Rockefellers, doing rituals under a 40-foot stone owl, which is symbolic of, as we saw earlier, is, is used as a symbol for the reptilians and was used as a symbol for the uh, Babylonian goddess, Semiramis Ishtar in ancient Babylon, which also was Sumer and now is Iraq. Uh, and these people who are running our world are doing these rituals. And what these... Satanists are doing is uh, in, on one level on one level they are connecting with these reptilian entities because what they do I've talked to people who've taken part in these rituals and uh, they've given me chapter and verse on, 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 on what goes on these um, entities not just reptilian but very various non-human entities operate just outside of this reality and what they do in the rituals, especially the major ones, is they create an energy stepping stone, an energy doorway, which allows these entities to move into this reality. I mean, I've talked to people who've described to me how these entities just manifested in front of them in these, in these rituals. So that's one level of it. But another level is that they do these rituals on particular points, the major ones anyway, on these vortex points. And um, in my latest book, in the appendix at the end, I publish a, I guess you might call it a, a deathbed confession, but it wasn't really a confession because he agreed with it. He was just explaining what happened. It was uh, supposed to be from a very high Satanist from the, what was called the Alpha Lodge in Sydney, Australia, in which he was explaining how the satanic structure controls the world. And one of the things he was talking about was how they're manipulating the energy field of the planet, again, suppressing it, stopping the information um, through ritual. And this is part of what he said. What most people do not realize is that Satanism is a ritually based practice and that this repetition has, over time, left strong impressions upon the morphic field, i.e. the energy field that we live in, therefore affecting us. Because we're interacting with this morphic field. We're therefore reading information into this, from this morphic field, which means we're reading information that they're putting into the morphic field through these rituals and <clears throat> messing with our sense of reality. And uh, like I say, that they do rituals on some of these ancient sites 
and so many churches were built on former pagan sites so they're on these power structures uh, power centers that's why so much satanism goes on in christian churches because they're on these power centers and then it comes the question of pedophilia and child abuse and its connection into satanism the um i, I said I, the i said earlier about these reptilian entities they want to feed off human energy there's one particular energy they want to feed off more than anything and that's the energy of children before puberty we all know that at puberty there is a chemical change but the chemical change is merely a holographic expression of a vibrational change that happens at that time as we move from childhood into adulthood so at puberty the energy changes they want the energy before the child's energy changes at puberty and so when um, we hear about uh, ancient sacrifices of young virgins to the gods young virgins was code for children this has gone on for thousands of years openly in some societies before now um, in secret and uh, this is what jo uh, Don Juan Matos, that shaman in Central America in the Carlos Castaneda book said. He's, uh, Castaneda is quoting him here. He explained that sorcerers saw infant human beings as strange luminous balls of energy covered from the top to the bottom with a glowing coat, something like a coat of plastic adjusted, a plastic adjusted tightly around the cocoon of energy. He said that that glowing coat of awareness was what the predators consumed and that when a human reached adulthood, all that was left of that fringe awareness was a narrow fringe that went from the ground to the top of the toes. That fringe permitted mankind to keep on living, but only barely. This is the energy vampiring I'm talking about and they want children more than anything else. And what's happening, and this is why these hybrid bloodlines the ratio of pedophiles among them is so dramatically high compared with the general population is because what's happening is when the uh, vehicle the human level is having sex with a child the possessing entity is drawing that energy off from the child and absorbing it and it's um, that's the reason or one major reason while there's this obsession with pedophilia you you can almost know that uh, uh, the vast majority of people uh, in the upper echelons of society are into this sort of stuff because they're they're possessed and and this is what that um, satanist from australia said in this confession or explanation of what goes on politicians are introduced by a carefully graded set of criteria and situations that enable them to accept that their victims will be our little secret. Young children sexually molested and physically abused by politicians worldwide are quickly used as sacrifices. In Australia, the bodies are, are hardly ever discovered for Australia is still a wilderness. And this is the reason, or a major reason, why vast staggering numbers of children we never hear about go missing every year now sometimes here and there the cover will be blown and we'll see just a little sample of what goes on in the cesspit this man a Nebraska state senator called John W de Camp started um, investigating this man a major uh, asset of the Republican Party called Lawrence King over the stealing of vast amounts of money through uh, the Franklin Savings and Loans uh, Bank in, 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 in uh, effect. But as he investigated the financial embezzlement, he realized that Lawrence King was running a massive pedophile ring in America, procuring and kidnapping children for major politicians and other uh, bastions of American society. It even made at one point one of the national newspapers, the Washington Times, where it says homosexual prostitution inquiry instares VIPs Reagan with Reagan Bush. This man is an unbelievable uh, pedophile, Father George Bush. I came across some of his um, victims 
um, when I was traveling America a long time ago, back in the 90s, and it's just um, built and built and built. I've gone on American radio endless times. I've said it in my books. The man is not just a pedophile. He's a serial child killer. And you don't, you, the, uh, the staggering thing, you know, the staggering thing, it's not even rare in the upper echelons of um, the system. This is Kathy O'Brien, who I met way back in the 1990s. Uh, she was a, a, in a in the American government mind control project known as uh, MK Ultra, and an offshoot of that called the uh, Monarch Project. And her, uh, she gave birth to her daughter Kelly while in the project, and so they took Kelly into the project. This is what she writes in a book, Exposing Bush, called Transformation of America, Trans in Trans formation of America, mind control. Kelly's bleeding rectum was but one of many physical indicators of George Bush's pedophile perversions. I have overheard him speak blatantly of his sexual abuse of her on many occasions. He used this and threats to her life to pull my strings and control me. The psychological ramifications of being raped by a pedophile president are mind shattering enough but reportedly, Bush further reinforced the traumas to Kelly's mind with sophisticated NASA electronic and drug mind control devices. Bush also instilled the who you're gonna call and I'll be watching you binds on Kelly, further reinforcing her state of helplessness. The systematic tortures and trauma that I endured as a child now seem trite, they weren't, compare in comparison to the brutal physical and psychological devastation that George Bush inflicted on my daughter and that was just one of his victims and the uh, British political establishment the American political establishment almost wherever I've looked there it is pedophilia and Satanists are running our world and they can do this to children because they do not have empathy therefore they cannot feel the consequences for the child of what they're doing and he wrote a book, John Dewey Camp, called The Franklin Cover-Up, and the Discovery Channel was so taken by the evidence that they, um, in association with a company in Britain called Yorkshire Television, produced a documentary about this paedophile ring. Hours before it was due to air, it was pulled, and every single copy, bar one, there's a really bad copy you can see on the internet, was destroyed. Because those that control the media ultimately are those in the pedophile and uh, satanic and secret society rings. This guy I mentioned earlier, Ted Heath, he, um, I, 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 when he was still alive, I said in a book in 1998 uh, that this man was a serial child killer and pedophile. This man has been responsible for the death and torture of so many children. And I said it in a book, while well, he's still alive, nothing happened. Why? It was true. We had a, a, a terrible um, tragedy in 1996 when this man, Thomas Hamilton, went into a school at Dunblane in Scotland and killed uh, the vast majority of these children and the teacher. They then um, closed the file on this man for a hundred years so people can't see what's in it. Why? Because this man procured children for very famous political paedophiles in Scotland and Britain. This girl, you might have seen a lot of this on my website, is called Holly Gregg, Down Syndrome Girl. She was raped by members of the Scottish establishment, including the legal establishment, uh, for 10 years. They had to flee Scotland when a mother tried to get, uh, were found out about it and tried to get uh, justice. And now this man, Robert Green, has been working with them to try and get them justice. Instead of having justice, instead of listening to the story, they've arrested him. They've stopped him even going to the area where this rape uh, took place over 10 years. They have raided his house, they've taken away computer equipment with his evidence on them, etc., etc. And the BBC uh, contacted him, a reporter started to say, we want to do a documentary on this because the evidence is, is, is compelling. And then he got a call saying, the upper echelon of the BBC has, has said we've got to cancel the project. And this is, it's possible for all this stuff to go on in our society because of this structure. You don't have to control everyone in social services, as we call it in Britain and America, to stop um, an investigation of paedophilia going on. You only have to control that level of social services that decides if there's going to be investigation. 
You don't have to control all the police to stop an investigation of paedophile and satanic activity. You only have to control the level of the police that decides when an investigation will or will not take place. Same with uh, the lawyers and the judges and all the rest of it. You, you, if it does get to court, you make sure one of your judges, one of your guys is hearing the case and it, it's, it's thrown out. And it's because of this structure that it, all this goes on and never hits the public eye. This man, David Berkowitz, became infamous as the son of San uh, killers, uh, killer in, in New York, serial killer. And from jail, he said, yes, I did it, but I did it with a satanic group that I was a member of. And he said this in a letter from jail. Satanists are peculiar people. They aren't ignorant peasants or semi-literate natives. Rather, their ranks are filled with doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and basically highly responsible citizens. They're not a careless group who are apt to make mistakes, but they are secretive and bonded together by a common need and desire to meet out havoc in, on society. It was Alistair Crowley, famous Satanist, who said, I want blasphemy, murder, rape, revolution, anything bad. Now, let's look at that. These Satanists, I am saying, are possessed by these reptilian and other demonic entities. These reptilian and demonic entities want as much low vibrational emotional energy produced as possible based around the base uh, um, concept of fear. And now these Satanists in high levels of society, as they're saying, doctors and lawyers, politicians, they are, he says, and he was one of them, they are bonded together by a common need and desire to meet out havoc in society. That's why. They're there to meet out havoc in society, which generates the energy of low vibrational emotion in the population because of what goes on, the havoc and the conflict and the, the wars, and that feeds the, the possessing controlling entities. Now, this is something to watch if it's not happening in the Czech Republic yet. Because it's happening in more and more countries and it is an epidemic in Britain and America. And like I said earlier today, it's coming out from Britain and America because they're, they're at the center of this. And it's coming out and as it comes out, it's going to affect more and more countries. What I'm talking about is the process by which what we call social services, the organization that's supposed to protect children, what they're doing is they're targeting children from loving parents who aren't being abused, who are under no danger and no threat, quite the opposite. Often the, the parents are doting parents uh, on their children. But what they do is they find an excuse for the children to be taken away to foster parents and then forced adoption from their uh, birth parents and they do it under a family court system if this is not happening in the Czech Republic for goodness sake don't let it the family court system that orchestrates this works like this I'm a social services person I decide that your children a child or children are in danger even though they're not I then get a court order from the family court and I take them away when I take your children away I tell you and this is the law that if you tell anyone about it or you go to the media and tell your story you can go to jail for three months and by the way if you do that you'll never get your children back the journalists are subject to these family court laws which says they cannot report these cases and so in secret, children are being taken from loving parents and put into uh, other families of social services choice without anyone ever hearing a word of it. And it's phenomenal, the, the, the scale of what's happening. I was talking in Trafalgar Square in London a few weeks ago and met all these people from all over Britain who'd had this done to them. This MP, Member of Parliament in Britain, has described... Uh, has called his, uh, said that his local council is kidnapping children. And the story after story, but they can't tell the full story because there's details they can't tell because of the law. And what's happening is a stepping stone, totalitarian tiptoe, which Aldous Huxley talked about in his book Brave New World, published in 1932. 
a society in which the state had total control of children and parents were irrelevant. They were just part of history because they were going to bring children up um, through the state in what, they call, what he calls in his book state hatcheries. And this is what, what this stepping stone is, is towards, that society. And like I say, if it's not happening here yet, that's the idea. Coordinate two, cement two. This could be controversial. I think it might be. Do you know what? I don't care. It's about time, it's about time the bloody truth was told. Zionism is racism. Now, what people don't realize is that what we call Zionism is not Jewish people. That's the trick. Zionism is a, on its play out level, a political philosophy, and on its inner core level, a secret society created from the start and controlled to this day by the House of Rothschild. And that's why in my books and on my website, I always call it Rothschild Zionism, so to keep underpinning the real force behind it. The Rothschilds have been responsible for some of the greatest horrors been inflicted on Jewish people in the last uh, few hundred years. Uh, and that is not about Jewish people and their benefit. It's about their agenda. As this lady says, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. But the idea is to put the two together in the public mind, so when you, ch you challenge the Rothschilds, you must be a racist. As I said earlier, racism is ridiculous. It's a nonsense. As uh, Joe Biden, the uh, deputy uh, president of America said, it's about the only thing he's ever said I agree with, you don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. You don't. And how many people know this around the world? That there are a large number of Jewish people who not only don't support Zionism, they vigorously and constantly oppose it. How many people know that? You don't read that in the newspaper. This says Judaism rejects Zionism. Zionism and Judaism are diametrically opposed. Zionism is the cause of Middle East bloodshed. Um, stop the Holocaust in, in, in Gaza. These are Jewish people. Actually, fundamentalist Jewish people in terms of their religion. Zionism is state-organized terror. Zionism is the cause of Middle East bloodshed. Yes, it is. It's meant to be, because the Rothschilds are behind it. End of Zionism equals peace. I am Jewish, and I want Israel to stop killing Palestinians. How many times do you see this in the news? You don't. We condemn any Zionist aggression against Iran. Our, another Jew against Zionism. It's not about a people. It's about a secret society controlled by the Rothschilds that use the Jewish people as a front to hide behind. State of Israel, the greatest oppressor of religious Jews globally. This is from Jewish people. Zionism causes global anti-Semitism. Yes, it does. Zionism spokesmen do not represent world Jewry. How many people realize this is going on behind the scenes? These are Jewish people and Jewish groups who've come to meet Ahmadinejad, who's supposed to be the big Satan for Israel. How many people realize that this is going on? Because all we hear is the Rothschild Zionist version of the whole thing, and people believe that, and they think that it, all, all Jewish people are for Zionism, all Jewish people are against Iran? No! Rothschild Zionism. The Rothschilds built and paid for the Jewish parliament, the uh, Israeli parliament rather, the Knesset. They built and paid for the Israeli Supreme Court building with all its Illuminati symbolism all over it. They orchestrated the takeover of Palestine. They orchestrated the movement of Jewish people out of Europe, many of which didn't want to go, by the way. And they have controlled that country ever since because they want to create constant conflict in that part of the world, and that's why they did it. And behind the genocide in Gaza, and that's what it is, is the House of Rothschild. It's the agenda again. And it is genocide. This is the 
Dictionary definition of genocide. The systematic and widespread extermination or attempted extermination of an entire national, racial, religious or ethnic group. That is what's going on in Israel. The, these, these are the, the figures, the orange ones are children in the last uh, major conflict in Gaza. This is the face of Zionism. This is a, a cartoon that tells a stunning truth. What do you tell me what you see? Combat boots. What's happening to the Palestinians is genocide. They're having peace talks in America and at the same time they're doing that, bulldozers are knocking down Palestinian homes and the people are being homeless and living in the streets. They're building this wall, so-called security fence, and in doing so, stealing very significant tracts of Palestinian land behind the wall. There you go, this is a Palestinian children's playground. Hey, there you go, we've got to build a wall. Off you go. This is Palestinian land in green in 1948. This is Palestinian land in, the 19, in 2000. We're now in 2010. It's less now. It's apartheid. It's apartheid like in South Africa. But not just, not just um, apartheid between Israelis and Palestinians, but apartheid between Israelis. The Jewish, uh, black, the black Jews from Ethiopia in Israel are treated with absolute contempt, appallingly. And these are Jewish people again. Jews condemn apartheid, boycott Israel. But we're given this black and white version of it. And what does Israel do? That. That's what they do. Why? Because they can. Why? Because their major ally, America, is controlled by the House of Rothschild, and Israel is controlled by the House of Rothschild. So America and Israel worked as one at all times. They have... Um, in the matrix something called the Zion mainframe well Zionism the secret society I keep emphasizing of Rothschild Zionism is in so many ways the mainframe or a mainframe that holds this thing together um, because from the center through Zionism they can uh, take control of so many uh, areas of society which then work as one unit I'm going to give you the uh, American example here we're told that a black American He's probably a Kenyan, but a black American is in control of the White House and, and calling the shots in America. Well, let's have a look at that, shall we? His main controller in the White House is an infamous, vicious man called Rahm Emanuel, who is his White House chief of staff. Rahm Emanuel is a Svengali figure who, whose father openly admits that he was a terrorist in a, a, a terrorist group, uh, group called Ergun, which helped to bomb Israel into existence in 1948. He's the man who has the ear of the president, and the president doesn't cough unless Rahm Emanuel gives him permission. There you go. You, you listen to me, mate. I'll make you a star. The other person in the White House, alongside Emanuel, is the Rothschild Zionist David Axelrod. He's the, now the White House chief, uh, uh, chief advisor, but he was the man who orchestrated Obama's entire election campaigns against Hillary Clinton and against John McCain. The, ma the main individual funder of Obama was George Soros, the Rothschild Zionist, Rothschild asset, who has been behind so much manipulation of Europe. This is his, uh, Obama's, um, one of Obama's foreign uh, policy advisors, Henry Kissinger, who's actually moved parties to advise Obama. And this man has been one of the major manipulators of the control system for the last 40, 50 years, Rothschild Zionist. When um, we had the crash of 2008, the financial crash, and Obama came in in November and then took official office in January, he appointed as his treasury secretary Timothy Geithner, one of the major manipulators of the crash, Rothschild Zionist, and alongside him, Larry Summers, another orchestrator of the crash, Rothschild Zionist. You have the budget director controlling the whole budget 
of the Obama administration up until about July, Peter Orzag, Rothschild Zionist. When he was, uh, he went in July, he, he was, uh, he's been proposed to be um, uh, taken over, his job taken over as head of the budget by this guy, Jacob Liu, Rothschild Zionist, who's been an undersecretary to Clinton in the State Department, alongside this man, James Steinberg, Rothschild Zionist. Now, as I go along here, the percentage of the population that is Jewish in America is 1.7% and a significant number of them will not be Zionists. Imagine if what I was saying now as I went through these people, Hispanic, black American, Chinese, people would be going, you can't have that many. But because of this, nothing's ever said because people are terrified of it. Head of the Federal Reserve, the privately owned Central Bank of America that dictates the economy of America, is Bernard Bernanke, Rothschild Zionist. He took over from the head of the Fed during uh, Reagan Bush, Clinton, and most of boy George Bush, Alan Greenspan, Rothschild Zionist, the major architect of the crash of 2008. One of the most uh, appalling banking operations in the world that was fundamentally implicated in the crash of 2008 and the crash of the Greek economy, Goldman Sachs, a Rothschild bank headed by Rothschild Zionist Lloyd Blankfein. The head of the World Bank, Rothschild Zionist, head of the International Monetary Fund, Rothschild Zionist, head of the uh, European Central Bank, Rothschild Zionist. I think I'm seeing a pattern here. These are a stream of uh, so-called czars in Obama's administration, Rothschild Zionists. This one, Cass Sunstein, has proposed that conspiracy theories should either be taxed or banned from circulation. Obama's climate change policy is controlled by Carol Browner, Rothschild Zionist, and Todd Steen, Rothschild Zionist. It could, they control America, and it's a secret society controlled and created by the House of Rothschild. Mossad, which can walk into Dubai using fake British passports, be seen on security cameras in the hotel to kill a Palestinian leader and then leave with no comeback whatsoever. They're not the intelligence agency of Israel and Jewish people. They are the enforcement arm of the House of Rothschild. That's why they turn up everywhere. And then Jewish people get the blame for it. At all was always so. Now, 9-11. The World Trade Center lease was bought a few months before 9-11 and the insurance against a terrorist attack massively increased by uh, this guy, uh, Larry Silverstein, Rothschild Zionist, very close to major politicians in, uh, in uh, Israel, like Netanyahu. And his partner was Frank Lowy, Rothschild Zionist, very close to major politicians in uh, Israel, like Netanyahu. And they did the deal to take the lease with this guy, Louis Eisenberg, the, uh, Rothschild Zionist, the head of the New York Port Authority. The head of the CIA at the time of 9-11 was George Tenet, Rothschild Zionist. And another major person in the, in the law enforcement arena was Michael Shertoff, whose mother was a Mossad agent. And he was a co-writer of the Patriot Act, which was introduced immediately after 9-11 and took away basic freedoms in America justified by 9-11 and stopping terrorism. Michael Shertoff, Rothschild Zionist, who became the second head of Homeland Security in America. The Pentagon at the time of 9-11 was controlled by Paul Wolfowitz, Rothschild Zionist, the comptroller in charge of the whole budget, Duff Zakheim, Rothschild Zionist, and also people like Douglas Feith, Rothschild Zionist. The neocon group I mentioned earlier behind the Bush administration at the time of 9-11 and then the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq were headed by people like Richard Pearl, Rothschild Zionist, 
William Crystal, Rothschild Zionist, John Bolton, Rothschild Zionist. And then you have the strange story of what became known as the Dancing Israelis. When the Twin Towers were hit, these people um, were filming it and high-fiving and dancing around. And people obviously reported this to the police. The police turn up, take him away, want to know what's going on. Next thing you know, they're back in Israel. And they're interviewed on Israeli television. And it turns out they're agents of Mossad, the Rothschild uh, uh, Enforcement Agency. And one of them said, we went there to film the event, to record the event. How can you go to record an event unless you know it's going to happen? This doesn't get in the mainstream media. The 9-11 Commission report that decided that the official story of 9-11 was true was overseen by Philip Zelico, Rothschild Zionist. The Bush speech, which started to move this conflict forward with Iraq and what have you, um, the axis of evil speech, uh, Iran, Iraq and North Korea, was written by David Frum, Rothschild Zionist. The first major Obama speech in 2008, setting out his Middle East policy, according to the Wall Street Journal, was written by James uh, Steinberg, Rothschild Zionist, this guy Kurtzer, Rothschild Zionist, Daniel Kurtzer, and this fella Dennis Ross, Rothschild Zionist. I bet it had a lot to say about Palestinians. So these people appear to be the, pre the President of America and the Prime Minister of Israel. They are both front men for the House of Rothschild. And this is why Israel, this sliver, sliver of land, has the biggest F-16 fleet outside of America. And one of the reasons they have it is when Dov Zakheim, Rothschild Zionist, was comptroller in the Pentagon, he designated a stream of these aircraft as scrap when they weren't, so they could be sold to Israel at knockdown prices. This uh, book by these two journalists and researchers, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, said this, Israel receives about $3 billion in direct foreign assistance each year, which is roughly one-fifth of America's entire foreign aid budget. In per capita terms, the United States gives each Israeli a direct subsidy worth about $500 a year. Not that they get it, it goes in military spending, etc. This largesse is especially striking when one realizes that Israel is now a wealthy industrial state with a per capita income roughly equal to South Korea or Spain. Now, the reason they get this money is because America, one arm of the Rothschilds, hands it to Israel, another arm of the Rothschilds. That's why it happens. That's why these strange things happen. You've got to re people have got to realize what's behind it. This is a former BBC and independent television, television news correspondent, Alan Hart. He wrote a book, Zionism, the Real Enemy of the Jews. Couldn't put it better. And he said here, Jewish people make up less than 2% of the American population, but account for 50% of the political campaign contributions. And that's why all these different people may disagree on one or two things, but on one thing they never disagree on. And so the Palestinians have got no chance. I won't tell you what's behind that, you don't want to see it. And why this is going on, the, this guy and his predecessor stay quiet. When, when there's terrorism somewhere else, they can't wait to find a microphone, these people. But Israel? No. This is a fantastic Jewish guy called Mordecai Venunu, who um, had the audacity to reveal from his insider knowledge to a British newspaper that Israel had a major nuclear weapons capability. Because the idea was you don't talk about it. Do, do you know, this is, this is true story, this is true. The official American policy with Israel over nuclear weapons capability of Israel is we won't ask, you don't say. That's the official policy. And therefore, everyone knows it, 
but no one says it in, in, in the American administration. As a result of revealing this Israeli capability, which I think is a good idea, we should know about it, he was um, kidnapped by Mossad, I think it was in Italy, brought back to um, Israel and spent 18 years in jail, 18 years, and he's still subject to massive uh, restrictions. And why that was going on? Not a frickin' peep from him or his predecessors. If that was Iran, they'd be calling for sanctions and invasion. This lady, Kay Griggs, was the uh, wife of a colonel in the United States Marine Corps. And as a result of that, she was shown around the US State Department. She was shown around the Israeli offices, and then she was shown around the Palestinian offices and the Palestinian offices in there were peopled by Israelis. This is the major manipulator of America um, in terms of Rothschild Zionism. It's called the America-Israel Public Affairs Committee, which sounds very official. It's a lobby group, and they control him. And, and, and if any politician goes against Israel, they move in on them. And the head of it at the moment is Lee Rosenberg, a very close associate of Obama in um, Chicago and one of the significant funders of Obama's election campaign. The Palestinians have not got a prayer. Americans, do you dare to say Israeli terrorism? No, they don't. Well, some people do, but not the government for this reason. And then again, and I, I emphasize, I'm not talking about Jewish people here, I'm talking about Zionists, Rothschild Zionists, member of the, members of this secret society, this is the Los Angeles Times columnist, a Rothschild Zionist called Joel Steen, who wrote an article saying that Americans who don't think Jews, Rothschild Zionists, I would say, control Hollywood, are just plain dumb. I had to scour the trades to come up with six Gentiles in high positions, he wrote, at entertainment companies. But lo and behold, even one of that six, AMC President Charles Collier, turned out to be a Jew. As a proud Jew, the writer said, I want America to know of our accomplishment. Yes, we control Hollywood. And how much of the global psyche is manipulated and programmed through Hollywood movies? This is uh, Shaha Ilan, a daily features editor on the leading Israeli daily newspaper. He wrote, the, the, the Jews do not control... Uh, the Jews do control Amer the American media. This is very clear, and claiming otherwise is an insult to common knowledge. And, ev and when he's saying Jews, I'm saying Rothschild Zionists. Behind it all is the House of Rothschild and their connections who are going into all these different areas of society that appear to be unconnected. But they are the cement. Rothschild Zionism is the cement. And, of course, programming the mind, control the media, you program perception. Over here, elephant in the living room, but people are terrified of saying it because they're terrified of being called racist and anti-Semite. Well, sod that. I'm interested in the truth, not a popularity contest, thank you very much. The same in Britain, same in Britain. They have a group called the Friends of Israel that are in all the major parties and work as one unit to make sure that policy towards Israel is to Israel's benefit. Our present Prime Minister David Cameron, Rothschild Zionist. This very day they're electing the leader of the opposition party called the Labour Party, the, um, uh, the uh, party I mentioned earlier in relation to the Fabian Society, and it's between two people, two brothers, both Rothschild Zionists. The guy who's infamous for manipulating British politics is a guy called Peter Mandelson, Rothschild Zionist, who actually flaunts his connections to the house of Rothschild. He goes on holiday with them at their mansion in Corfu. And this guy was a 100% owned asset, and still is, of Rothschild Zionism and the house of Rothschild. And that's why he and George Bush moved as one unit in invading Afghanistan and Iraq. And what they do, and again, this is the House of Rothschild, they have created groups like B'nai B'rith, Sons of the Covenant, and an offshoot of that called the Anti-Defamation League, with this guy, Abe Foxman, at its head. 
And its job is specifically to target anyone who's saying the things that I'm saying or criticizing Israel and their role in the Palestinians and targeting them as uh, anti-Semites and racists and try to stop their public meetings and all the rest of it. Uh, particularly I, in, in, in Canada, I've had a lot of trouble with that myself. And what they do is they equate criticizing Israel's treatment of the Palestinians with being anti-Semitic. Israel's crimes against the Palestinians, anti-Semitism. And I've had, uh, I've had this over the years, um, but um, that says, amazingly enough, I don't give a shit, and I don't. It's about time the truth was told. This is another um, a br amazing Jewish man called Norman Finkelstein, whose parents suffered in the concentration camps of Germany, and he's come out and criticized Israel and its treatment of the Palestinians and, the, and its treatment of, uh, of, of the Jewish people and he has had his academic career destroyed for doing that and what he's called because they can't call him anti-semitic because he's a Jew they call him a self-hater anything except he might be saying something that's true and again I don't know if this is happening yet in in the Czech Republic you'll know better than me but around the world now we're seeing what they call hate laws coming in where truth is no defense, if what you're saying is true, it doesn't really matter as long as you might upset somebody, to stop people talking about this. And uh, they've just introduced a bill in America. And these groups, these Rothschild Zionist groups, are suffocating and controlling. And one of their targets now is the internet. Because the internet has been a wonderful way of getting out information that normally wouldn't get out there, and they're starting to get very, very worried about it. And in America, a Rothschild Zionist called Jay Rockefeller is trying to get the internet censored. And in Britain, until the, the last election in May, it was the Rothschild Zionist uh, Peter Mandelstein in Britain uh, trying to get the internet censored. And in America, they're trying with Rahm Emanuel and all these people to get the um, ability to switch off the internet whenever they want under the guise of national security or terrorism. And we, we need to open our eyes to this and stop falling for the idea that Zionism is about Jewish people. They have used Jewish people mercilessly, not least in Germany, for their own ends. So now we're on this home straight to tyranny, as they want. And this is the guy they've chosen to be the front man for it, for most of the world, not least in America. He reads uh, his speeches off these prompter boards, speeches written and overseen by David Axelrod, Rothschild Zionist. And um, I don't know if you've ever been, that says teleprompter, without it you're a stuttering, or idi stuttering idiot. I don't know if you've ever been on YouTube and uh, seen examples of Obama when the teleprompter falls down, stops working. He doesn't know where his next word's coming from. And people have perceived Obama as a an intelligent man. This says delusion, assuming a level of knowledge that isn't there. Uh, because what they're doing is they're comparing Obama with Bush. And, you know, as the saying goes, slow horses look fast when they're running past trees. <laughs> um, he's not intelligent at all. He's an actor. And what we have is a secret agenda to introduce this police state and centralized control and this is the movie designed to bring the secret agenda into being through legislation and change in society without people realizing that that exists that's why the mainstream media is a movie I call journalists um, movie correspondents that's what they are mostly uh, and so when you, when you have this situation with uh, Obama, just, it's like the Pied Piper, change, change. The election of Obama was a massive mind control ex uh, uh, operation. This says um, Tony Blair. That, he's the black Tony Blair. He's the white Obama. Will you lie first, Tony, or shall I? Oh, after you, Barack. These people lie by reflex action. It's part of their daily, um, their daily life. And while um, Obama was claimed to be the people's man, his major funder um, was Goldman Sachs and a stream of Wall Street names. They're going to vote for someone who's going to be for the people. This is why Obama 
has been connected to so many rogues and people like this guy Tony Resco ended up in, in jail for fraud. He was uh, responsible for so much of, of Obama's uh, political career. And Obama's two um, close manipulators and controllers also are Soros and this guy Sabignu Brzezinski, um, the national security advisor to Jimmy Carter. Brzezinski, like I said earlier, has been uh, mentoring and bringing him through since at least the 1980s to become president at this time, all orchestrated. And this is a book that a Brzezinski um, wrote in 1970. What's that? Um, 40 years ago. Um, in which he said this, predicting the future. Predicting the future, explaining the future he knew was coming. The technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. And he knew because he's an insider, Brzezinski. That's why he's on Obama's shoulder. He, along with this man, David Rockefeller, created in 1973 an organization called the Trilateral Commission. This is part of a network of organizations controlled by a secret society in London called the Round Table, or Britain anyway, England. The first one was the Royal Institute of International Affairs, 1921. Then came the Council on Foreign Relations in America, 19, uh, uh, what was that, 21? That was 21, that was 1920. Then came the Builder, no, the United Nations after the Second World War. Then came the Bilderberg Group, 1954. Uh, there was the Club of Rome in 1968. That was created to use the environment as a, a, a means of controlling the people. And the Trilateral Commission of Brzezinski and Rockefeller came in 1973. And these work as one unit to push this agenda forward. And the number of politicians that are members of these groups uh, is extraordinary. Now what Brzezinski talks about, and if Brzezinski talks about it, it's the agenda, is something called Eurasia. And he says that if you control the area known as Eurasia, you control the world, and that um, they must get control of Eurasia. Now this is a key part of Eurasia, which goes from basically Europe across to, to China and into China. And it's very interesting because they want to um, cr control this area, for instance, all the way to China. So you've got Georgia in Eurasia. You've got the Ukraine in Eurasia, which were these people's revolutions, it says here. You've got Kyrgyzstan, where they've done the same twice. And then over here is Israel, with say control. They're now demonizing Syria because they want that. They're already in Iraq. They're already in Afghanistan. And now they're destabilizing in so many ways Pakistan, which takes them right to the Chinese border. There's one major country in the way of that whole deal, and that's this one. And that's why they want Iran. It's nothing to do with uh, nuclear bloody weapons. It's finding an excuse to take that so that they virtually complete the job, apart from Syria, of taking that whole area of what um, uh, Brzezinski says, you need to control if you're going to control the planet. And you're just ticking them off. If you carry that map around with you and, and watch the television news, you're going to see them coming up. And what they're doing, for instance, America is, is being demonized for doing all this, but what they're doing is destroying America. They're using America to, to, to push this on, but the idea is to destroy it for, for this reason. If you want a world government with total control of the, of the planet, you cannot have superpowers who have the economic and, and military might to say no to you. So we're in the process of uh, destabilizing and bringing down America militarily and uh, economically to absorb it into this global system. And we're going to see events unfold which are going to bring China and Russia into this too, because um, 
they, anything that's powerful enough to say no to the world government is designed to be undermined and absorbed. And by the way, China, China society, is the blueprint for global society. They've been developing that under, around closed doors. That's why there's so many connections between top American politicians like the Bush family and Kissinger and China. And so the time's running out for America. Once it's done its job of being used, um, they'll destroy it uh, as, as the superpower it is now. And it's being done um, under the, um, if you like, the, the, the puppet period of Obama, who's really just a, a puppet, just that, just a puppet. And he's there to smile and, 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 and sell tyranny and control with a smiling face. But that's what's behind it. And you could put communism there too. Just the face to hide the real face that's going on. That's why nothing's changed. Do you remember Guantanamo Bay was going to be closed? Maybe he forgot. He's had a lot on his mind. Nothing's changed since one replaced the other. Nothing's changed. He's got, he's got worse in Afghanistan. This says they think he cares about them. <laughs> What we're looking at is presidential problem, reaction, solution. And they played the American people like a violin. Adolf Hitler said, the great masses of the people will more easily fall for victims to a big lie than a small one. What they did with Bush, the Bush period, was they created lots of problems, not least the economic crash right at the end in September 2008, and also the invasions of Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq. And so, so by the time we got to the next election with this guy, people are sick of, it's like, do something. And so he was sold as the solution to the problem. And all he did for nearly a year was say trigger words, meaningless words like change, hope, and something to believe in. The idea was that he never ever, and he didn't, specify what he meant by that in detail. Because the idea was it was a mass mind control operation. You have to watch this in elections because it goes on in all countries. They just did a major job in America this time. The idea was for him to become an empty screen on which the population projected what they uh, believed was change hope and something to believe in. He became a, a all things to all people. That was the idea. Don't be specific until you get in. As Adolf Hitler said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Obama. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Politics worldwide is getting like this now. Just trite phrases that mean nothing. I love you, you love me, I will get you stuff for free. Oh, thank you. We can believe in that. I found this, I think, sums up Obama. The wolf found that shepherd's clothing worked even better. And so we have a man of President Peace whose first act in office was to authorize the bombing of Pakistan and has vastly increased the military operation in Afghanistan, says he's pulled out of Iraq, just changed the name, 50,000 troops still there. Not a word from him about the horrors in Iraq of, uh, and, and Afghanistan of spent nuclear uh, f uh, fuel or, or, or spent nuclear uh, uh, material in the bombs and weapons that they've dropped on Iraq, which is having horrendous birth effects and other effects. The man is a complete fraud and fortunately, his honeymoon period has not been anything like as long as it promised to be. He's just another puppet of the system. And he's just uh, there to push it on while appearing to be different. The Obama rule, ignore the words and watch the actions. And when you watch the actions, woo. Just to show you nothing's changed, by the way, this is um, Bush and here's Obama. You know they say, they say, if you want to know what's going on, follow the money. I think you follow the Bono. I think you follow the Bono. Look at him. He's everywhere. All these, all these people involved, Bono's shaking hands with them. I don't know. So anyway, we've been moving around down this uh, timeline of, of the control. And they're, they're coming in to 
the point where they want to introduce the, the, what they've been working towards. This structure. Um, and uh, that's what's unfolding now. And to underpin this control system, they're bringing in this Orwellian global state, this police state. And this is not for the masses, because the masses are no problem unless they wake up and see what's going on. This control system is for those who have woken up and are waking up to see what they couldn't see before and realize what's going on. In Britain, you, um, on an average day, walking through a town or city, will be seen by 300 and growing security cameras. They've now got satellite technology and other technology which can take your number plate and put it through a, a computer and get everything there is to know about you as you go along the road. The satellite system is um, much further advanced than we're given uh, allowed to know. They're bringing in these, uh, these systems of uh, all body scanners. Some people say it would be terrible, you know, people will see my naked body. What I say is, if people see my naked body, it serves them right. That's what I say. <laughs> but the radiation they give off is something different. And, and, it, and if you are involved in paedophile rings, what better than these, this system? Here's another one, Kissinger. <laughs> We're seeing the... Again, I'm, I've, I've not been in... Um, Czech Republic long enough to, to comment on this, I'm talking about what I'm seeing in country after country, including my own in America, where the police are becoming more and more militarized. They're becoming an arm of the military. This is happening everywhere uh, that I, I go. And we're, gi we're giving policemen in places like America, other European countries and Britain, these tasers, which give off 55,000 volts and have killed many people uh, around the world not least people with heart conditions and stuff. And people have said to me, well, that's bad for the taser with people dying. No, it's not. They want people to die from the taser. Because when people start dying from the taser, when a, when a cop says, you do, a, do what I say or I pull the trigger, you do what he says. This is what it's about. Fear, intimidation. Same with the sound equipment that they're uh, breaking up peaceful crowds with in North America. And then there's the microchip. People laughed when I said this years and years ago, this was coming in. They're not laughing now because it's happening. And I talked to a CIA scientist in 1997 who um, told me that this was coming and said that, first of all, microchips outside the public arena, he said in 1997, were so tiny they could be inserted through hypodermic needles in vaccination programs. And he said that was the idea. And we now know that what he was talking about then in secret as nanotechnology. And he said, people think that even those that are, have awakened to it, that microchips are for electronic tagging. So the computer knows where you are. That's one level of it, he said. The real level is not that which goes from the chip to the computer, but what comes from the computer to the chip. He told me in 1997, that these, uh, once people are chipped, they can be mentally, emotionally, and physically manipulated from a distance by uh, information going from the chip. Because the chip is in what? It's in a biological computer. They're now having these things called um, uh, human computer interfaces, where they put a chip in, in, in the brain, God knows how you'd want it, and you can work the computer. I mean, are these people crazy? I don't know. The reason that that can happen is they're connecting two computers, one much more advanced, but still two computers. So you get a microchip inside the body computer, then, of course, the potential for manipulating us from afar is vast. In, in, um, in Britain now, they're starting to um, replace on babies the, the name tags with barcoding. That's a stepping stone, totalitarian tiptoe, to microchipping children at birth, because that's what they want. And also they found that barcoding that they can put on, and you can see this, but that ones that can be imprinted on the skin without anyone seeing them. And it's all about manipulating the body computer so that um, we have, are externally manipulated, our reality is externally, 
externally manipulated. And it's the same with the, uh, the chemtrails and all this stuff that's going on. It's all part of this uh, attack on the human body computer, mentally, emotionally, chemically, and electromagnetically, with all the electromagnetic white microwave fog that we live our lives in in the cities these days, not least the wireless internet. And this is all about destabilizing the body computer. It's all being orchestrated to attack our ability, not least our kids' ability, to decode reality in the way that we have the potential to do so, to keep us in the box. Monsanto is, is one of the major Illuminati companies on planet Earth, and it's the one behind genetically modified food. And the idea of genetically modified food is to genetically modify us. That's what it's there for. And interestingly, one of the major areas of the body that genetically modified food attacks is the RNA, which is um, like the default mechanism that stops the blueprint from um, mutating. Then there are people who have realized this and are looking at what they eat. They're starting to grow their own food. They want to take food supplements to overcome what they're not getting in food. So there's another side to this where they're targeting those people. It, there, there are legis there's legislation in America, for instance, but it's in other countries that's making it more and more difficult to grow your own food. The idea is